Blessed are you, Lord Jesus Christ. You came down and took upon you our humanity, that you might raise us up to share in your divinity. By the obedience of Mary, Lord made flesh, dwell among us. That the birth of Christ may hallow all life, Lord made flesh, dwell among us. That the descent of Christ may uplift all of creation, Lord made flesh, dwell among us. That the humility of Christ may teach us gentleness, Christ have mercy. That the presence of Christ may be within us, Lord have mercy. That the power of Christ may be among us, Lord have mercy. That the spirit of Christ may fill us, Christ have mercy. O Lord, make your home within us, as you took upon you our nature. Grant that we may ever rejoice in your presence, King of kings and Lord of the Lord. Let's sing this hymn together.
commit reading this morning is Isaiah 25, 1 and 4 through 9. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress, a shelter from the storm, and shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall, and like the heat of the desert. But you silence the uproar, as a cloud shades the earth from the heat, and the shouts of the ruthless are still. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all people banquet of the best of meats and the finest of wine. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all people, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. And in that day they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation.
He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scripture. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning with Jerusalem. You are witnesses to witnesses to these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high.
now that we are out of Lent and into Eastertide, we have tables again. So please do gather around if you are able to um, around the tables with each other and pray with each other and communion with each other. But the rail will also be available. Um, we also have potluck lunch after church today, so stick around for that. Um, I made a yummy salad, and it is yummy. And there are other yummy things, I have seen them, they are yummy. Um, and then on Wednesday, there is the Daniel Bible study this week. So if you're able to make that, it's here at 7 p.m. And Daniel's a weird book. It's really good to go through as a group. So if you're able to make it, I highly encourage it. Okay, here's where things get wild. Things are coming up. So first is the litter cleanup that we have scheduled for April 20th. I'm going to be sending out a Google Doc for folks to sign up for breakfast items because we will be having breakfast at 8.30 and then doing the cleanup from nine until we feel like we're done. And um, the rain date for that is the 27th, but hopefully we won't need to use that. So that's FYI number one. The new thing that you've not yet heard about is that Habitat for Humanity is having an open, a ribbon cutting ceremony for the four houses in Charles City. And that's going to be Saturday, May 4th. So if you're able to attend, please do. A lot of folks from this church helped out with that, and it's very good to see the day finally here. They've had to deal with a lot um, of just vandalism and weirdness in building of those houses, so we want to support the folks that are moving in there. And then this is another new, new thing. Um, several churches in the county, including Peace Hill, are joining together for Church in the Park on May 19th. Um, so this is instead of us having church here. This is our church service. It is Pentecost Sunday, which is a pretty significant Sunday to be gathering around with other churches in the county. There's gonna be a ton more details about what we will need, including folks making desserts, sign up sheet for t-shirts, because they want each church to be wearing a t-shirt of its own color. We were one of the last ones to what sign up. Call, what is our color? You don't want to know. know. <laughs> they, they, said, they said fuchsia. I think it's more of a hot pink. <laughs> They're all very bright, summery, springtime colors. So yeah, it's yeah. definitely not in my color tone. So, uh, it'll be fine. So we'll send up a sign up. We'll send out a sign up sheet for that as well, um, and we'll send a sign up sheet for making desserts and any other things that the, they will need. It's like a whole production. They do this every year. It's like the setup starts the Saturday before. It's an all day thing. There's free food. There's like vendors that are really, they're not vendors. They're like places where you can get information and learn stuff and all that. Um, Justin and Tanya are doing a lot of organizing with it and we will get you more information as it comes up. But the important thing to know right now is that May 19th, our church is going to be participating in Church in the Park instead of having a normal Sunday service, and that will be at the fields behind the schools. So it's not like all the way in Harrison Park, it's a lot closer than normal. What time will that service be? The, start, the service starts at 11, um, set up and stuff for those who are involved, I think is at like 10, yeah. but again, more information as it comes out. The other thing we're gonna do, because there's a lot of stuff starting to pile up this spring and summer, is we'll have like a little calendar of events in the next handout that we do so that you'll be able to track along with what's going on. But the main point is, look for sign-up sheets that will be coming up. Is the online calendar up to date? Mostly, it doesn't have Church in the Park on it yet, but it has some of the other stuff That's on it. That's an excellent question. We will update the online calendar too. Um, with that, because we have communion, we're not doing the, the like specialized prayer time, so please do pray with each other around the tables. But Tom, can you give like a quick update on Asha? She's uh, getting better each day. Um, you know, checking that there's little hallmarks she needs to uh, make happen, and they're happening. Um, so uh, she has a post-op follow-up uh, coming up at some point, uh, where we're going to find out you know, what exactly we <coughs> find. Um, but uh, yeah, so far she's doing really well. Um, I want to thank everybody that helped. So much, uh, <coughs> and I want to point out what a miracle it was that this all happened when it happened. Yeah, um, this is something that could have been delayed like a year or more, um, but it just kind of all fell into place. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah, so now praise for that. Yeah, absolutely. We're grateful that she was able to have this surgery. 
um, and to have it as soon as she did. So Asha is continuing to recover. Please do keep praying for her um, and then pray with each other during um, communion. I think Tanya has the youths and it's over to Justin mm -hmm. for the sermon. service on the 19th, so if you'd like to sing along with all the churches in the county, um, they're serious, though. They're going to have, like, three rehearsals and send out the music ahead of time. They're very well organized. three rehearsals? We don't sign up now. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're going to have a, a joint choir. And there's a, I heard rumors of a bounce house, but I didn't want to say that until after the kids were gone. Um, and other fun things. But I don't know why we're announcing any future events, because you guys know the world's going to end tomorrow, right? You heard about that? Okay. So, um, for the sake of the recording, you are joking. I am joking. <laughs> for the sake well, of the recording. To Jeremiah. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, there have been various predictions on various radio stations that people probably ought not listen to as much as they do. That um, because there was an earthquake in one place and there's going to be an eclipse in another place, that that was the end of the world. It could be. I mean, anything could be the end of the world. Lots of things could be. The world could end at any time. But I highly doubt that. Um, that uh, various things lining up the way they do, meaning that the world is going to end in that specific way um, on God's timetable. And it's always good to be reminded that when people were asking Jesus for, like, when would they know that the end was going to happen, he said, I don't know. He said, like, it doesn't really matter, and I'm not telling you, and I don't really control that timetable, and just relax and do the right thing, and you'll be in the right place when the right time comes. And then when horrible disasters happen and they say, oh, does this mean that this and this mean that this? He says, it's always a sign that you should always be repenting because you could die at any time and you don't know. So um, we're going to go ahead and plan as if May 19th will happen, even though uh, <laughs> Christian Radio said that maybe lightning's going to strike the Statue of Liberty or something. I don't know. But anyway, that's not what we're going to be preaching on this morning. Uh, the text is from Luke 24, 36 to 49, uh, which Matt read earlier. Not the one that Matt read, but the one that the other Matt read. <laughs> Not front row Matt, back row Matt. <laughs> wow. Right. But to talk about this, we have to talk about ghosts. And to talk about ghosts, we have to talk about South Carolina. Uh, when I was 10, um, my family drove from Florida to South Carolina to visit my brother, who was attending college there. And he was going to be in a theater production at, uh, at the end of the, the school year, and uh, we were going up to visit him and see his college and see this theater production. Turned out it was a very small part, so um, we, we blinked and we missed it. But we had this really long drive, and I was really tired. You know, you're a little kid and you're sleepy. And I had to sit in the middle, squished between my siblings, and so I was like, you know, didn't get a good, good sleep on the car ride up there. And then we had to sit through a Shakespeare play, which when you're 10 and there's like this three hour play about like English kings killing other people in order to become the king of something else, it, it's not as thrilling as everybody thinks it is. And so you kind of, you're waiting for there to be a sword fight or something. And uh, I fell asleep. I fell asleep about the third scene and I was out. This nice, comfortable, dark theater. And then all of a sudden, I woke up, and there were ghosts and spooky music and spooky lighting. And they, there were all these horrible, scary ghosts standing on the stage going like this. And I freaked out. I didn't know what was happening. I, it took me a long time to ever want to go to a Shakespeare play again. Turns out that in Richard III, there's a scene with a lot of ghosts. Because Richard III has been killing his way to the top, and he's been bumping off these people or causing them to be executed. And so the night before his big showdown, he gets haunted by all these ghosts of all the people that he's killed. And they say, like, you're going to die, and, and you know, you're, we're going to get revenge from beyond the grave for you killing us. I didn't know any of that. All I knew was that it was terrifying, and uh, there were people in horrifying makeup. One of the problems that the disciples had when Jesus came back from the dead was that they thought he was a ghost. 
they knew what ghosts were. They had a concept of ghosts. Everybody back then had a concept of ghosts. What they didn't have was a concept of someone physically coming back from the dead. That was not on their radar. They were not expecting it, which is um, one of the arguments against when people say, well, the, the disciples just hallucinated that they saw Jesus because it's what they were really hoping for. No, they weren't. They weren't really expecting that he was going to physically come back from the dead. And so when he does show up, especially because there's something kind of mysterious about him and he can sort of come and go in mysterious ways and show up in locked rooms, they think ghost. And when they think ghost, they're terrified like Richard is and Richard III because they think that he's come back to haunt them for revenge because that's what ghosts often do. I don't know if you've seen things like, you know, Scooby-Doo or any of the, actually Scooby-Doo, they mostly turn out to be fake. But um, <laughs> most of the time when you, when you see someone come back from the dead, it's because they, there's unfinished business, right? And they've come back to get revenge on the people that killed them. And when they see him, they think that there's some sort of apparition. And Jesus is always, in these uh, post-resurrection stories, he's always very much concerned with making sure that they know that he's not just a ghost, that he's more real than that, he's something else. There are two things in this very, very dense passage, there are two things that I want to underline today. Um, there's other stuff that we've talked about, the whole second half about where he sort of talks about how the whole storyline of scripture is going towards him. Um, we're not going to focus so much on that today, but I, I want to talk about two things that are true of the risen Christ. The first is that he offers forgiveness to those who don't deserve it, and the second is that he is really physically risen because God has not abandoned creation. So first, he offers forgiveness. So on its own, Jesus coming back from the dead isn't good news yet, right? I mean, think about, you know, these ghosts, or think about, like, the Terminator or the Mummy or something, where people come back, but it's it's horrifying, or all these zombie shows and movies where, you know, someone coming back from the dead isn't, on its own, a good piece of news. And the disciples probably had a lot of guilt going on, because they knew that they had failed to stick with him, they'd failed to believe all the predictions that he gave them that he was coming back. Mostly, except for the women, the disciples did not show up at the tomb on Sunday morning to meet him. It's like they didn't even really believe that it was going to happen, despite all of his assurances. They had totally failed in the follower department. And they were worried that if he did show up, that he was going to show up and be like, well, here's a comprehensive list of the ways that y'all have failed. I'm going to start over with a new group, Disciples 2.0, who can make it work. And at best, you guys are going to get a really stern talking to it. Worst, he'll do whatever ghosts can do to you. But what are his first words when he shows up? He says, peace to you. Peace be with you. He offers them peace, not condemnation. This is so much better than what they were expecting. And honestly, it's better than what I would do. I've been let down or, or hurt by people much less than what the disciples failed Jesus. And I would be angry. I'd be keeping lists. I'd be gossiping, I'd be telling them all the ways in which that they, they had failed, make sure you don't do it again. I'd be writing a stern email. But no. He comes and he says, peace. And then he eats with them, which is always a sign of being at peace with someone, reconciliation. We, in scripture and in those cultures back then, you didn't sit and eat with someone unless you were inviting them in and letting them in your group, unless you were at peace with them. And it's still the case. You often sort of gather and eat with people that you like. And you, if you're totally on the outs with someone, you don't want to gather and eat with them. But he offers forgiveness. And then he says, not only is he still making them his group to do his mission, but he says forgiveness is going to be extended to everyone. He says, repentance from sin, turning away from sin and forgiveness will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem, and we talked about that with Pentecost last year, and then spreading out into the whole world. See, the resurrection is the final 
piece of what starts at the cross. It's not complete without the resurrection. Christ has to leave all of our sin, all of our failures in the grave. Paul says in Romans 4.25, Christ was raised to make us right with God. And then in Corinthians, he says, if Christ was not raised, you were still in your sins. Christ being raised is the sign that God has finished that process of putting our sins and our failures behind us. The disciples are dazed and, and they stand there astonished like this is too good to be true. And it still sounds too good to be true. That you can fail Jesus, let him down, fail to do the things that you should have done. And he still speaks not condemnation to you, but peace. Some of us struggle with guilt because we know the ways that we have messed up. The ways that we have failed in our personal lives, in our, uh, in our relationships, or at work, or in secret, or in all kinds of ways. To do what we should do. To say what we should say. And it holds us back from God. But the consistent message of the risen Christ is that he offers peace, not hostility towards us. He is loving towards us. And then second, he's really physically risen, and that matters. So, he says, I'm not a ghost. He says, I have flesh and bones. But I love that he says bones, not just blood, because bones are like solid and heavy. And they're one of the, the most solid things about us when we think about it. And they're, they're real. And he says, I'm, uh, touch me. And it's actually, the word means like, handle me. Come on. Get in there. Like, grab me. You can see, you know, just like, poke my clothes or something. Just, I'm real. And then he shows them his hands and his feet. And now, I don't know if he's showing them the scars to say, hey, it's really me. Like, I'm really the guy that died three days ago. Or if he's just showing them hands and feet because ghosts never have hands and feet. They're always sort of gliding along above the ground. And, but he's, he says, I've got hands and feet, and you know me. They had lived with him for three years. They knew his hands and his feet. They had lived in close quarters, and they knew this was him. The same rough carpenter hands. The same feet that had walked all those miles with them through Galilee and through Judea. He says, I'm not a ghost. And then he asks, and I love this, he says, while they're standing there because they're like, can this be happening? He says, do you have anything to eat? He's hungry. I mean, he's, he's been dead for three days. He's hungry. And he, he says, they, they give him a piece of, it's, it's very specific, they give him a piece of broiled fish. I love that. And he eats it with them. Think about it. The risen Jesus has a digestive tract. And hunger. And other such human things. He's not above it all now. He's not just like too good for all that. He eats. Which is one of the things that he loved to do with people during his time as you know, ministering on earth. He loved to have meals with people and to gather them around and to feed people that needed to be fed. Christ came back physically. And one of the things that that says to me is that our redemption will be as physical as our dying. All of us, I don't know anybody in this room, young or old, whose body is doing exactly what we want it to or is functioning at 100%, or is doing everything as it should. We are all either sick, or tired, or breaking down in some way, or malfunctioning. We've had several rounds of replacement parts. Some of us are no longer factory standard. We've had lots of aftermarket uh, adaptations. Or, and it's not just that we're, we're old, or we're breaking down, or we're sick, it's also that Brain chemistry isn't what it should be, and our, our minds are doing things that they shouldn't sometimes. Or we look at our bodies and we're frustrated with them, or they're always taking us in directions we don't want. We are physical. And the good that we do and the bad that we do are expressed physically. There's no such thing as just spirituality that's just spiritual. 
and all over the world, the suffering that people experience is not just mental or spiritual, it's physical. There's kids starving today, in not just in desert places, but also in war-torn places. People that should be able to eat that aren't. There's people in this county, as we know for, through the efforts that we've had with working with these hunger organizations, there's people in this county that don't know where their next meal is coming from. And that's physical hunger. People are sinning and abusing each other physically and um, our broken world is broken physically. And so our redemption needs to be physical as well. God is not just interested in um, wafting us away to some spiritual heaven at the end and letting the world burn because he doesn't care about it. He cares deeply about this world that he made, that he entered into as Christ and that he died for. In Romans 8, Paul says, what are we waiting for? He doesn't just say, to go to heaven when we die or something like that. He says, we're waiting for the redemption of our bodies. He says, for the creation waits, not just us, but somehow all of the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, but all creation will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the, the beginnings, the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait for our adoption as children, the redemption of our bodies. Christ is saving not just souls, but bodies as well. Yes, this world will need to be remade. It's not continuing on forever just like this. But he rose physically, and that's important, and that's good. The things that we love about this world are somehow in some way going to be taken with us. In the 1950s, the writer uh, John Updike, who was sort of the hotshot young writer um, and had lost the, the simple naive faith of his childhood and, and uh, become non-believer, went through a crisis of doubt and he came back to the God of his childhood. He came back to the Bible and he looked at it and he realized he needed Christ. But he needed not just the Christ that was being preached at the time, which was, well, Christ came back, but as an idea or as good teachings or as a memory. He wrote a poem called Seven Stanzas at Easter and read the beginning of it. I love how physical he makes the resurrection. He says, make no mistake, if he rose at all, it was as his body. If the cell's dissolution did not reverse, the molecules re-knit, the amino acids rekindle, the church will fall. It was not as the flowers each soft spring recurrent. It was not as his spirit in the mouths and befuddled eyes of the eleven apostles. It was as his flesh, our flesh. The same hinged thumbs and toes, the same valved heart that was pierced and died, withered, paused, and then regathered out of enduring might, new strength to enclose. Fingers and toes and amino acids and cells. We need more than just a hope that our spirits will live on somehow. We need a hope that Christ is bringing as the prayer we said at the very beginning, that the scent of Christ may uplift all of creation. He's bringing it all up with him, and raising it and redeeming it. This world of pine trees and pollen clouds, and I don't know why all these things exist, and all these other things I'd like to ask God about, mosquitoes and ticks, but it's physical and it's real. This world where we hurt each other physically, we say things, we do things, and we are trapped in cycles and systems that hurt people physically and enslave people's bodies. That's what God is coming to redeem. This is God's world, and he has not abandoned it. And what we do here and now matters, and we'll live on. 
This morning we are celebrating communion, and as always, I am so glad that Christ did not say, think about this in memory of me, but eat and drink and do this in memory of me, because he knows that we need physical actions to take physical food and drink into our mouths because his redemption is rescuing the physical stuff of our bodies as well as our souls. You can believe that Christ offers forgiveness for what you've done as he did to the disciples, that he offers peace, and that he's going to redeem this broken and very physical world. Let's pray. Christ, give us faith to hear you speaking peace to us, even though we don't deserve it, to hear you speaking forgiveness over the sins that you have put away. We thank you that you care about this world, you care about the physicality of this world. You made it and you have not abandoned it. We are eager for the day when it will be liberated. As we go throughout this week, through whatever may come, through natural disasters or phenomena or through the ups and downs of ordinary life, we pray that we will be faithful day in and day out in this world you have given us. Amen.
right to give him thanks and praise. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, whom you sent to save us. He came with healing in his touch and was wounded for our sins. He came with mercy in his voice and was mocked as one despised. He came with peace in his heart and was met with violence and death. By your power, he broke free from the prison of the tomb, and at his command, the gates of hell were opened. But the one who was dead now lives. The one who humbled himself is raised to rule over all creation. A lamb upon the throne, the one ascended on high, is with us always, as he promised. For those who are weary, for those who feel the brokenness of this world, we carry the brokenness with us of our own minds and bodies, Jesus prepares a table. This table, the bread and the wine, the body and the blood tell us that we are not abandoned and that he carries this world and us into life with him. This table is rest for the weary. It's forgiveness for the burdened. It is hope for the doubtful. And it is a promise that our lives and our redemption is in, I can't even say this word, is inextricably, there you go, is inextricably connected with Christ's resurrection. Because he is alive, we are alive too. So this table is for us. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and having broken it, he gave thanks for it, and he said, this is my body, broken for you. When you eat this, remember me. And in the same way, after dinner, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant made by my blood. Whenever you drink this, remember me. And when we drink from this cup, when we eat this bread, we remember that Christ died in our place, but we also remember that Christ is alive now and at work in us and in this world. And we remember that and proclaim that until he returns to complete his work of peace and restoration. The table here is open and the tables around are open. <laughs>
this song, which uh, has been put to music, Salvation Belongs to Our God. So let's stand and sing this song of celebration and looking forward to the day when she comes true. Yes. Yeah. 